Christos Anesti, Christ is risen. Welcome all to another Sunday School Sermonette. It's a joy to be with you all. This Sunday, or this sermon, we're going to speak about the iconostasis, the icon sheet, and the solea as a whole, and we'll be going over to the bishop's throne as well. So let's analyze this and come in to understand a little bit more about what our solea means and what the iconostasis, why we have this wall of icons up front in between the altar, the solea, and the rest of the church. Come follow me. We're going to start right at the center. So the icon sheet, the iconostasis begins actually from very ancient roots. It begins from Jewish times where we had a veil covering the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies. And the first hint of this that we get without an actual sheet is from Moses approaching the burning bush in the in Exodus. In this story, right before, before he frees the, the Jewish people from e Egypt and he gets the Ten Commandments, this burning bush that he encounters informs him, of course it's Christ, informs him that he needs to take off his, his shoes because this ground is sacred. As in this is the Lord's ground and we must treat this differently. And that becomes in flesh, that becomes more material in the, the, the veil of the temple. So the veil, when they had the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the tabernacle, the, uh, the tabernacle contained the Ten Commandments, it contained the, um, the laws of Moses, and it contained a, a couple other things that were isolated in the Holy of Holies, and the high priest would only go there but once a year. And we remember this also in Hebrews, um, St. Paul talks about this. So this is what our icon sheet represents. It's the veil of the temple that separates the Holy of Holies from the rest of the church. But it's a little bit different in our New Testament times and since Christ. We're going to start with the Orea Bible. Traditionally, you would have a, a gate here, a beautiful gate here called the Orea Bible. That would have maybe a picture of the Annunciation here in Archangel Michael. We have the Annunciation depicted above the altar, above the, um, the ash, the Placidea that has um, the Archangel Gabriel coming to the Baniya telling her, because this is where the Incarnation happened. Right through these, this arch, right through this, these doors, on the altar, we have the sacrifice, the liturgy takes place, and that's where Christ becomes enfleshed in the body and the blood, and we're all able to receive communion from that. So it's a beautiful thing, and that, having that icon right above the altar on the gate, depicts that and shows us kind of a hint of that, that this is what occurs here. But something really important happened on Great Friday at the cross. And that's the veil of the temple. If you remember from the readings, from the 12 readings we do on Great Friday, um, be, the eve before that, we read that the veil of the temple was torn in two. So this is sim symbolized whenever we open the gates, and especially here where we have gold, where the priest or the deacon comes forward with the gifts, with the communion, saying, with the fear of God, with faith and with love draw near. When he breaks through the veil, it's sort of a, you know, reenacting that every single liturgy. And when the priest comes through holding the word of God, holding the scriptures the, to read the gospel, it's again another a mini re, um, reenactment of this uh, mis mystical event, this magnificent event that happened when the veil of the temple was torn into and Christ came to the people. He didn't just stay in the altar, he came and met all of us and we're all able to partake of him, just the same, all equally. Then here we come, there's always four primary icons, part of the iconostasis. These four are Christ, the Banahia, Saint John the Baptist, and the saint of the church. Here we're gonna start with Christ, of course, the object of our worship and the object of our entire faith, why we are called Christianity, is Christ himself. With, of course, the traditional standing icon where he is holding the, um, the Book of Life and he has the whole on depicted in his halo as Christ always does. So this is our object of our faith and you'll notice the priest several times during the liturgy, turn, let us give thanks to the Lord, let us bow our heads to the Lord. And this is something that we we need to have Christ here because he is always the object of our veneration and of our worship. But to his right hand, to Christ's right hand, will always be his mother on the other side of the gate. And the Banahia here, 
is always holding the Christ child, and you'll notice the particular icon that we have on the iconostasis, I think it's most iconostasis, if not all, is directress, where she is pointing the way to Christ. Because this is what the Baniya, as, her, as the perfect virgin mother, always does. She points the way to Christ and shows that this is who, this him is who we need to be always turning to, the Christ child here depicted. And it's a beautiful icon, and you'll see us turning to the Baniya when we say um, in Orthos Din um, Theotokos, let us honor and magnify the Theotokos and the mother of the life. And we turn towards her and receive her blessing and honor her. Now let's come across to the other side. Next to Christ in the Iconostasis will always be St. John the Forerunner. St. John the Forerunner and the Baptist. And you can see the, the depiction of his clothing. It's not exactly smooth like Christ. It's this rough camel hair that, that, he, that he wore in the desert. And you can see that he's a little unkempt. He has his beard a little bit longer, it's a little more scraggly, and his hair is usually depicted that way. Because he lived in the desert, unlike, his, unlike Christ, his, um, his Lord. The interesting thing is that you'll notice Christ and St. John always look very similar. And this is because St. John, as Father John can tell us very, very well, was actually a cousin of Christ. And his, mo his mother was actually cousins with the Baniya, so he's like a, a second cousin to Christ. So they look very similar, and he has this desert appearance. So we always have St. John the Forerunner, known as the greatest of all the prophets, and the greatest until Christ to, to come. And Saint, um, Christ himself says that. So we always have St. John the, the Forerunner depicted up here on the Iconostasis. Now next to the Banagia on the other side, we have, of course, we still have the Bosco period. So we have the resurrection banner and the cross and the icon of the resurrection. But... Typically, we wouldn't have this, except for the 40 days after the Bosco. Next to Baniyya, we'll always have depicted the icon of the patron saint of the church. So you'll have different, um, different icons in this place always. Here at Archangel Michael, of course, we have the depiction of the bodiless, the, the bodiless Archangel Michael, our host, our champion, our, the supreme commander of the angels. And he, of course, is our defender, a mighty, mighty champion. And he's my patron saint as well. So it's nice. We have Father John, patron saint, right next to Christ. And we have my patron saint right next to Banahia. Um, so here you might have St. Nicholas. You might have St. Demetrius. You might have the Ayatriyad. You might have the, um, the, the holy, um, you know, some other event, uh, epiphany, or some other um, icon depicted here, depending on who your patron saint is, who the church is named after. Forgive me. Patron saint means that. Um, and here at Archangel Michael, of course, Archangel Michael is our, um, is our patron, and Archangel Michael we have depicted next to Bonnier. So those are the four core icons of the Iconostasis on all icon sheets across the world in Orthodox churches. But then you'll have others along the walls. You'll have others next to them sometimes. And at Archangel Michael, we have two on each side, but we'll get to them in another video. Now one last thing about the Soleia that I want to that I want to um, highlight. We have the Soleia, and sometimes people look to it as a as a, a stage, but it is not. It in no, by no means is this a stage. This is by no means is a place where a drama takes place and everybody witnesses or, or watches it. The liturgy is something that it's a little bit raised. We 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 have the Soleia a little bit raised up just so that people can see a little bit easier. But it's not a stage. We all participate together. So never let the solea or the, the altar even make you think that you are not part of the service because you're an important participant. And that's why at certain times in the liturgy, where we always have responses to the petitions, we say, Lord have mercy, um, give me a But most importantly, we have the amens, the amens, especially during the consecration when we are making, when the, the bread and the wine becomes the body and the blood. So don't think that this icon sheet, this wall, or this soleil is something that that's where the work is done and we witness it. We are all part of it, and that's why the soleil is usually depicted in a way that can kind of come out to the people to kind of give this more perspective. Like here in Archangel Michael, we actually kind of surround the soleil, and it gives more of this authentic spirit, this feeling by physical space of being part of it and being united in the practice of the liturgy.
Now we're going to come to the last thing. We're going to talk about the bishop's throne. Here we have the bishop's throne, and you'll notice anytime the archbishop or any of the bishops come and they're serving with us, they will take their seat upon the throne. And we don't, nobody else um, sits up here. We talked last week about the sin throne in the altar. Well, this is where he primarily sits during vespers, during orthros, most services that are not liturgy. There's only a short time where he would sit here during liturgy because the, during the divine liturgy, he's usually in front of the altar leading the, um, leading the service. But for all other services, he will be here, and this is his place when he, when he visits his church, when he just wants to sit and listen to a sermon. This is his place that he takes. It used to be historically where you would have um, a throne here for the, the secular authority, perhaps the emperor, perhaps a governor. Um, in America, the equivalent would be the president or prime minister in certain countries, and you would have them take their place here. And the bishop's throne could be opposite or vice versa, where they would have their place of glory, where we have this secular authority and we have the bishop. And something that you'll notice, um, although it's a late Byzantine um, symbol, the double-headed eagle is um, a little bit representative of this, of the worldly power and the church authority coming together and working as one for the Lord's glory. So here, though, we have now um, just the bishop's throne. We do not have an emperor anymore, obviously. And so we have the bishop's throne remaining here, and we'll always have a depiction of Christ as the, um, well, usually Christ as the high priest here is sitting upon his throne as a hierarch. Um, so that's our whole solea. That's our iconostasis and the bishop's throne. If you were ever wondering what the, why do we have this chair here that nobody sits in? And why do we have all these four icons beautifully depicted here? This is why, and also an explanation of why we have this wall, this separation, to keep that place sanctified and sacred. We don't want too much foot traffic there. We want it to treat it differently. And just like Moses was told, take off your feet. If we're ever entering the holy altar, we should reverence and we should be very, very respectful of that. And it allows, it allows us out here to be a little more, um, I don't want to say irreverent, but a little bit more um, free to, to go about and for, for motion and to do the work that must be done. So that's our iconostasis. I hope you enjoyed the video. Christos Anesti, Christ is risen, and we'll see you next week.